Good though. He's all ready to go. Yeah. Take speed. Okay. Tom, in retrospect, Creedence Clearwater can certainly be hailed as the ultimate American band. Why do you think that is? Oh, well, before I go on, should I be mention Creedence yeah, Clearwater in the Creedence answer? Creedence Clearwater, yeah. Okay. Um, Creedence Clearwater Revival is being remembered. You're saying remembered as an ultimate rock and roll band. Um, I think it's a ni very nice compliment. And um, I really can't say why, other than just maybe the type of rock and roll that we chose to play that was a combination of black and country music, you know, kind of like how it all sort of came together. Um, and in much the same way that Chuck Berry put it all together. It's, you know, it's the only thing I could think of. <laughs> you guys did songs such as, you know, um, Bad Moon Rising and, and Fortunate Son and, and Lodi that sort of commented on America's working man's point of view and came across very much that way. What was, what was the inspiration for these songs? Um, I think, especially in terms of the way John would write, um, I think he was thinking not to just write the same old kind of love songs, you know. We we played around with with a few love songs like Suzy Q and I Put a Spell on You, those kind of songs. But, but when John chose to write, he seemed to want to get deeper into uh, what was going on at the time in the late 60s, you know, and, and a lot of it had to do with uh, the plight of the working man and uh, young people, men and women, who were confronted with the war and how it was affecting them in a lot of ways. And, he chose to write about that. Who were uh, who were the the musical heroes <clears throat> of the band? <laughs> that's a it's a broad question. If you want to know who the musical heroes of the whole band were, you know, it's uh, it covers a lot of people. Let's um, talk about you. Who were who were your musical heroes? Who did you okay. grow up listening to? Um, I grew up listening mainly at the very beginning to the uh, the uh, rhythm and blues vocal groups of uh, the West Coast and some of the ones from the East Coast, like the Five Satins, and uh, on the West Coast, the Penguins and the Medallions. And then I got into the blues artists like uh, Jimmy Reed and B.B. Uh, King a little bit, and uh, Jesse Lee Sims, a lot of the... When I first started listening, there's no such thing as Top 40 radio yet. So I, I, in order to hear what I liked, it was... Um, uh, either black radio or or uh, pop stations that would play mostly Patty Page or something. So I wasn't too interested in that. You know. <laughs> how did uh, how do you think that that your personal musical tastes and 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 influences? How do you think that that propelled the music of the group along? I mean, how did that come out in, in, this, in, this, in the sound of the group? Well, I think everybody in the band was feeling pretty much the same way about. Uh, the uh, way that pop music was in the middle 50s or late 50s when, when we first formed. And we didn't consciously go out of our way to try to sound like a black band. You know, there was parts of country in it. It's just that it was really that we liked black music better than the kind of white music that was being presented to us at the time. That, um, for instance, the Philadelphia type of music that was being pawned off as rock and roll was not really what we thought it was about. So. Uh, we kind of were more, I don't know, we were more influenced by the guitar bands, Elvis Presley, for instance, or Buddy Holly and the Crickets, Eddie Cochran, um, in terms of white people that were playing that kind of music, you know. But um, our early heroes were definitely black, so it, it kind of maybe just unconsciously came together. It, it can be said that early Creedence Clearwater uh, revival music was swamp influenced. <laughs> What does that mean, and how did that, how did that come about? <clears throat> uh, what is Swamp Rock? It's really, um, it was funny how people put that name on it, Swamp Rock or uh, Bayou Rock, uh, simply because we called the second album uh, Bayou Country, and it, it suddenly became, this was a kind of music, uh, it had really been around before, you know, uh, somebody like Lightning Hopkins or uh, Slim Harpo had already sort of done that kind of music, but it was an area of uh, mystery to us 
and um, a lot of vibrato, pop staples kind of thing on the guitar. And John's vocal, you know, is more like Howlin' Wolf than than uh, Fabian, for instance. And um, it was just something that we evolved to, but we didn't set out to create Bayou Rock. Were any, were any of the band members, uh, excuse my ignorance here with this question, were any of the band mem members from any Bayou areas? Everyone in the band was born in the Bay Area, um, either Berkeley, Oakland, or Palo Alto. <laughs> no Bayous around there. <laughs> no. It was, all the experience really was from listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. Not, it's, it's like the music that we liked was from the South, but, but we never got to go there until well after the band was you know, popular. And we went to Baton Rouge and to the crossroads and got to see all those places. We got to see fireflies. <laughs> What was it um, having you know having been influenced by this sort of this sort of music in this area of the country? What are you what are your memories of, of finally getting to go there? Was it what you had visualized from the music, or was it totally different to you? Um, the thing that, that surprised me the most was how depressed the areas were. That it was still like it, what I pictured it to be like in the 30s. It was still like that. You know, houses up on stilts and a lot of poverty and. It wasn't real romantic once you saw it, what it was really like. I think that happens a lot. You know, I know it's happened to me a lot in my life. You, know, you have these sort of wonderful romantic images of some place, and then you go there and you go, yeah. ooh. Like Hollywood. <laughs> like Hollywood, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when I first went to Hollywood in 1959, it was, uh, um, it was still pretty exciting, you know, because I was 17. It was a big, big deal. But when I went back a few years later, there was, there was hardly any, any music or movie things left actually in the city of Hollywood. It was all outside of it, you know, so. Right. But I guess it just represents, the word represents something to, you know, people that don't live here. Oh, sure, sure. It's a, I had that very much that sort of same feeling the first time I ever went to New Orleans. You know, I was expecting it to be, you know, jazz being played on every <laughs> corner and everything. <laughs> no, it's become pretty commercial. Let's, um... The, no, let's not. Let's go to a different question. The late and mid '60s, um, or the mid '60s, was a time of uh, of change and social protest, and really sort of still of innocence before the entire change happened. What are your memories of that period? Well, my memories are are really vivid of uh, the early '60s and and uh, actually the whole change from middle to the end. Um, I was in Berkeley at the time. I was born there, and I went all through school in Berkeley. So that when that all changed, uh, when Mario Savio started speaking about, you know, uh, freedom of speech and the steps at, the, at Cal Berkeley, uh, it was just roughly, you know, less than a year before the Beatles hit, and and this whole so social revolution took place, you know, all over the world. And it, it really, in Berkeley, it became very obvious. What used to be a real kind of a quiet town as I was growing up turned into a, just a, um, a haven of political thinking, you know, and it was, uh, there were a lot of weirdos, but there were also a lot of people who had, who had right things to say, and um, it took me, uh, right at, when it first happened, I wasn't against the war in Vietnam. By the time 1966, 67 came around, I had completely changed my mind from where I was, and I was totally against the war, you know. Um, it, it was it was a, an awakening more than anything for me, and then the summer of love '67 was when the band, like our band, really went completely full time. We stopped going to school and working on the side and all that, you know. So um, I I probably wouldn't be the person I am if it hadn't happened that way. Living in Berkeley in the '60s themselves, you know, I, I might have been a completely different person. Do you, when you were at when you were living through it, and uh, looking wait, let me start again. Looking back on it now, particularly that period in that summer of '67, is is very important to what happened to a lot of people, like you just said, and and to America. At the time that you were living through it, did you realize how important it was? Did you have any sort of idea what was going on, how big it was? It was, it was so important to me, and and I was so aware of it that. Um, when I talked to other people about it and they didn't understand me, 
I, I couldn't figure out how they couldn't see what was going on around them. It made, it was such a big change to me, you know, it's like, it was like my hair just grew, you know, and down to my shoulders by itself, you know, no effort and everything just kind of just went Um, it seems like during that time, um, people <clears throat> seem to, to care more deeply about social issues, and, and musicians in particular. Um, do you think that music had the power or, or helped to change things because of what musicians were doing? Um, I think that the music had a lot to do with the way people were changed and and um, I think that the Beatles had more to do with that change than anyone else. Uh, they were so outspoken every time they did interviews, not like me, you know, I keep it all hit. <laughs> no, they were very outspoken, you know, especially John Lennon, of course, and, and uh, they made everybody think, especially if you were anywhere near their age and were thinking uh, just thinking at all. You, know, you didn't have to be a musician to know what, what the Beatles were all about. So the music was like getting your attention and then as soon as they opened their mouth you'd go, oh, you know, and, and it might have been something you hadn't thought about. And I think, I personally think that they changed the world. You know, they came along and changed the world. Do you think that, uh, or do you think that musicians have, have, in the past couple of years they seem to be being, as I was talking to the other guys about being very involved in, in political issues. Do you, do you see it as being parallel to what was going on in the 60s? Do you think people are getting to a point where they're caring again? That's an interesting question, you know, as to think if, if to, was there a period of time when people stopped caring as opposed to uh, now when everyone seems to be getting involved in um, at least trying to help their fellow man. It isn't, maybe it isn't so much against any particular war, but they're... they're uh, trying to take the, whatever power they have through music and generate money anyway, you know, to help people that are less fortunate. And um, I don't know, though, if, if you could compare it to the 60s, you know, it's like a, it's, it's just a different time. Do you think that, uh, or do you think that uh, lyrics today and, and, and some of the, with some of the people that, that we're going to be talking about in this show, like John Cougar and and Springsteen and and um, and there's somebody else. Oh, Jackson Brown. Do you think that lyrics are becoming more political and they're reflecting more of, of what's going on and maybe some of the problems that we're having in America today? Well, this off cam for you. Who you say you're going to be talking to them also in conjunction yeah. with this? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that there are certain writers around that that uh, put into their music and their lyrics. Um, songs that, that um, well, let, me, let me start over because okay, I lost sure. myself. I think there are certain, certain artists around that put into their lyrics um, relative issues, you know, besides just the, the standard, uh, like Phil was saying, I want to rock you all night long, you know, that, that does get overworked. Um, there are some people around, I'm just trying to think of who they are because I'm kind of reaching one of those, you know, impasses in my head. Bruce Springsteen does come to mind, though. He's uh, definitely on the track, you know. Let's play um, a little bit of musical association. Okay. Okay? And I'm going to name some people, again, people that we're going to be talking about in the show. And um, just sort of give me your personal views on them and, and if they had any effect on, on you as, as a musician. Um, Woody Guthrie. Uh, Woody Guthrie really isn't, I've, I got introduced to Woody Guthrie really through uh, Bob Dylan, not personally, but he always talked about Woody Guthrie, and I didn't really know who he was until after Bob Dylan spoke of him, and then I went back and listened and got into him, but he didn't, it, I was like too late for me to really be influenced for, you know, by him. Do you think that, uh, do you see a strong, uh, a strong line between, say, Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan? I think, from what I've read anyway, there's a, there's um, a direct line from Woody Guthrie to Bob Dylan, and probably from Bob Dylan to uh, Bruce Springsteen and um, John Cougar Mellencamp. What I think what John Cougar's doing, personally, uh, like in 1985, I thought that was the best album of the year. 
Hank Williams. Hank Williams, um, I was also, again, too young to really hear it. I got into him later, and um, I heard a lot of other people doing his songs, and then I realized what a great songwriter he was. And uh, I got one of those greatest hits collections and listened to him, and uh, he was really amazing. His son's real amazing, too. <laughs> do you hear any of... Uh do you hear, are there any bands today that you hear Hank Williams in that you think have been real directly associated, I mean, influenced by him? Um, should never start with it. Um, I think that, that Ricky Skaggs is, is very much influenced by Hank Williams. And um, I can't think of anybody. He, he just has a large effect over the country music market, especially traditional country. But... Um, I can't think of anyone in particular. Okay, how about, it's okay because I can't either. <laughs> how about uh, Chuck Berry? Chuck Berry is, uh, can I be very candid? This is, in my opinion, if Chuck Berry had come along in the 80s, they would be calling him the king of rock and roll. But because he came along in the 50s and and it was socially unacceptable to white people, you know, be very honest. He's just, he's just too black for white people, then especially. Um, he's the guy who brought it all together to me. He wrote all these lyrics that everyone could relate to, that were all about kids at the time, and they're still universal when you hear them. And then he took a country rock feeling, um, country western feeling, and then put blues licks across the top and presented this whole thing of the duck walk and you know I mean like he was I mean Elvis was great but I still think Chuck Berry was even better. I agree. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is, is like a person who keeps going through all, all these changes right in front of our eyes you know and he's, he's he tries a little of everything became a born-again Christian for a while never you know and then I guess he's not quite as heavy into it now, but uh, whatever he does is interesting and, and um, this new thing that he's doing with Tom Petty is great. So he's like a pioneer, I guess. Let's go back, Let's go back to the 60s and talk about Dylan for a second. Um, did he have any influence on you then? Were you, were you a Dylan fan or were you an admirer of what he was doing at the time? Yeah, I, Bob Dylan was... I, I wasn't really into the kind of music he played. It was more folk, folk rock and I was more of a, in the like rhythm blues or hard rock kind of music. Not, not like heavy metal is now, but hard rock, you know. Uh, this little place, Carl Perkins or, or um, James Brown, you know, that's different than me heavy metal anyway. Uh, so, but I was a big fan of Bob Dylan and the songs that he wrote. And um, on a lot of the songs, I really liked the, the sound of his voice, the way he said things. You know, as soon as the song started, you know, it was the one and only Bob Dylan. John Fogarty. Well, that's a, it's kind of hard for me to talk about John and, and be unbiased, you know, because uh, we're in the same band together. But I think that he had one of the most unique voices. I, I used to tell him, and I, and I guess it's okay for me to say it, I was the first one that heard it. So I used to have to reinforce him and say, <clears throat> I think it's right up there with Ray Charles and Van Morrison, you know, it's a voice that's distinct and everybody already really liked that voice. And um, I had no idea that he would go on to write such great songs too, though. So I think he's great. What do you think, of, with his, with his, uh, with his last album, did do you think that they were really songs, again, that really reflected what was going on in America, as, as a lot of the Creed and stuff always seemed to? Well, I, the last album was really painful for me because um, it sounded, the old man down the road sounded so much like Creed that it was hard for me to get past that. So ultimately, I never bought the album. I never heard it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Fred. We're on tape. Okay. 